So we need to communicate also that by finding disease at an earlier stage makes treatment less expensive and makes our success rate go up. So these are some uh, things that I just want to try to change your mindset a little bit um, or have you rethink some stuff. So we've got to shift our focus away from vaccinations and stress this quality and length of life. And that's what they're paying for. And that's what they want. That's, that's where the value is. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my clinical history here. And this is my story. Uh, like I said, I'm a regular practitioner. Uh, I went back to the small town that I kind of grew up in. When I was in veterinary school, I had dreams of going back to this town of Proctorville that's on the Ohio side that, uh, because I saw a void there. And uh, I, I, after my senior year at vet school, I went down and interviewed with some people in that area for a job. And they said, you know what we're doing? We're getting ready to build a new clinic in Proctorville. And my heart just sunk because that was my plan. So I ended up joining that group because I figured I couldn't beat them, uh, being a new graduate and all that. So in 93 to 95, I worked for them. And then uh, in 94, they finished the clinic and opened it up. And uh, in 96, one of those partners decided to retire. And uh, I bought her half of the practice. And uh, so I became a 50% partner in a three clinic practice. And then lo and behold, just getting started, surgery numbers were coming up. We would do probably maybe 10 surgery, eight to 10 spay neuters a day. This low cost spay neuter and shot clinic opened up about two miles. I got to convert that to kilo meet kilometers, don't I? <laughs> so that's about four kilometers maybe or whatever, but a short distance from my practice. And uh, that was uh, a shot in the arm, so to speak. And then on the other side of us was a, a practice that had been in existence since the 1960s. And this old guy, the practice was paid for. And uh, I'll get you away. And, you know, I, he didn't care if he made any money. So here I am, a young veterinarian just buying a new practice, and I'm surrounded by these the competition. So early on, I had to start thinking different if I was going to survive. And so um, what we decided to do, uh, and I, I want to tell you about my associate, Joe Snyder, is a year behind me in school. Uh, he's uh, probably the most thorough veterinarian. He's more of an internal medicine kind of guy where I'm more of a surgeon. Everything I am, he's not, and everything that he is, I'm not. We're exact opposites. But that makes a nice uh, partnership in practice because he, he finds things that I don't, and, and I can do things that he can't, and that, that sort of thing. But he always said to me, he said, you know what? He said, you create the practice that you want. The practice that you guys are in right now is what it is because that's what you created. You've nurtured a culture and an environment through decisions you've made. So what you have is the product of what you chose, right? You don't want to believe that, maybe, but, but it's just true. And if you want it to be anything different, you have to do something different. So anyway, we were faced with some challenges. And um, so we had to look at the culture of our practice, the quality that we wanted to have, and our clientele. And what happens is, is when you change your culture and maybe your fee structure and how you practice and the tests you recommend and the things you do, you find out that you attract a certain type of clientele. And, uh, you know, the people that wanted the free shots and the cheap spay, they went over there to the, the low-cost place. I can't compete with that. So I just yielded to it. I said, you know what? I can't, I can't do that. But the strategy then really became kind of simple. Um, be the doctors and the nurses that you were trained to be. Um, and I was at another lecture, and the, the speaker was talking about being a pet advocate. And I thought, wow, you know, I never really thought about that. But that's really what we're supposed to be, is a pet advocate. And if you're always looking out for the best interest of that pet, then you have a tendency to recommend what's the best for that pet. But coming from that large animal background, I'm thinking, well, they won't pay for that. You know, that little demon on the shoulder here is saying, well, they won't take that. They won't, you know, you can't sell them that. And so, and then Dr. Snyder's over here saying, yeah, they will. You just got to tell them it's necessary. It's important. And, you know, so I've got this, you know, angel on one side and the devil on the other side, torn between, uh, you know, what to charge and whether or not to recommend something because I was afraid that, you know, they would think I was trying to rip them off. And I think that that's a big part of what holds us back at times. So we had to learn to become less dependent on things that other people do and more dependent on things that set you apart. And that's a scary place to be, like that little fish that jumps out of the bowl, you know. Um, it's kind of scary, you know, going against the downstream and all that stuff. So, but that's kind of where we were. Here's a picture of that old building, uh, Proctorville. Uh, it's 3,000 square feet. And that was supposed to be 
just a satellite clinic of the original mothership clinic in Ashland, Kentucky, which is a big, bigger, busier practice. So those owners had opened this with it just anticipation of it just being a kind of a, a satellite just to do routine things and then send the harder things over to the Ashland Clinic. So uh, just uh, in 2012, April of 2012, uh, we moved out of that building into the new Proctorville Animal Clinic. But we developed the attitude of pet advocacy. We used a wellness approach as a model and I put the P and B on there just to remind me to say that we did wellness as a practice and as a business. There's still a lot of veterinary practices being managed as medical practices, not as businesses. And uh, you know, that might not make sense to you, but oftentimes they don't look after uh, the financial side of decisions when they, when they, when they buy equipment or uh, you know, when, when they implement a program. And so those, those kinds of practices, you know, they're subject to uh, trouble when, you know, when hard times come. So um, we always looked at best medicine and combined it with best business and, and tried to make those two merge. And uh, th that worked real well for us. But we've also found that you have to invest in human capital. And I learned that term from being on a school board locally there. But human capital means that you educate your staff and you ed educate your clients and you educate your staff so that they can educate your clients. And then you repeat that and you repeat it and you do it again and you keep doing it. So you have an environment of learning and education in your practice. And, um, and then we learned how to recommend services with conviction. Um, and I'll talk about that when I get to the five R's of, of compliance and, and practice growth. But then here's the next thing. The next caveat is, is when you start doing wellness and testing and doing more diagnostics, you start to find things. Then you gotta be a real doctor. <laughs> you know what I mean? You gotta learn how to handle your findings when you find elevated liver enzymes and when you find uh, kidney disease. Um, and so we had, there was a learning curve. I mean, we, we learned it in school, but you, you get values that you don't quite understand all the time and you have to go back and be a real doctor. So. We, we, in a sense, became less dependent on spay, neuter, and vaccine income, decided to go the high quality service route. We created the image of being the best and not the cheapest. And the proof of that is, is all those people that went to the spay, neuter clinics, well, not all of them, but a large number of them, they started coming back when their animal got sick. And they'll say, well, I got my shots down at the spay, neuter clinic, but when Buffy gets sick, I'm coming over here to see you. And that's really where I want to be. You create the clients you want, you create the practice you want by creating the image that you're the best and not the cheapest. And then you have to communicate the value of your service and then you gotta charge appropriately for it. Um, you have to study strategically your fee structure. Um, I think that's a, a key to survival. We're in a competitive market, uh, shoppable items, you have to make them somewhat competitive, you know, those phone shoppers. And um, we'll talk about the receptionist and boot camp and all that stuff, but, um, Gosh, I need three hours. Can I stay longer? Can I come? Would you guys invite me back next year to do this again? <laughs> but anyway, um, we had to make some changes. So we had a paradigm shift at Proctorville, and this is our new lab. And so that lab in an afternoon has one or two employees dedicated just to reading samples. And uh, this is another difference that I've noticed. We empower our technicians. You call them nurses. But I, you know, from in surgery, um, I do a little pre-op exam. Um, they've already done the pre-anesthetic blood work. Um, they'll bring me the results. Even if they're normal, I like to see the, the normal result and before we go to let them do anesthesia. They calculate anesthetic doses. They put in IV catheters. They induce anesthesia. They put them under the monitor. All I do is walk in and do, be the surgeon. And they recover them. They take post-op temps and, and um, extubate and do all that. And, um, we totally empower them and, and, and it ends up being a beautiful thing because when they have ownership in that case like that and, and they feel a part of it, wow, you've got really a valuable employee there. But um, I'm gonna just take this opportunity for a commercial break. <laughs> but um, rim systems and abaxis, uh, you know, we have a hematology unit there on the left, uh, VS Pro, which is a PT and PTT and a fibrinogen machine, and my equine practice is pretty close by, so they'll, they'll drop by and do a fibrinogen from now on again. If we have a liver disease or a sample that doesn't clot well, if we have any suspicion, uh, you know, that a sample is not going to clot, we'll go ahead and run, a, run that. 
And then uh, this is our chemistry, the uh, VS2. And the beauty of that thing right there is in 12 and a half minutes, I can have a full chemistry panel. And back to my technicians, our model is the receptionist, you know, check the patient in. They bring the chart back. The nurse technician takes the chart. We have a compliance checklist that the receptionist filled out based on the history of the, in the, the old chart. And um, then she looks at that and it tells us if they've been on heartworm prevention, when their last fecal exam, if they're on a preventative, uh, when their vaccines are due, all that information that you need to know. And then the nurse goes in the room and takes a thorough history, does a brief nurse exam, flip a lip, look for dental disease, check the skin, look in their ears and whatnot. And, you know, and they'll record down, uh, you know, body weight and temperature and all that. And then they'll come out and give me a synopsis of what, what they've seen. And, but when they take the dog back for the temperature and the, uh, and the body weight, they're already mentioning to the client, you know, Dr. Dyer might want to run blood work today because uh, Bozo here is six years old and we have this aging chart that says that that's about 65 in human years and it's about time to start thinking about doing some wellness screening. So that technician's already drawn the blood and then she writes on the chart that I have a purple top and a, and a red top tube already drawn and puts a little box there so I know that blood's already been drawn. The client's already been prepped. Um, my receptionist actually mentions it first and then, you know, the, the, the nurse follows up. And then by the time I get in there, in some cases, they've already run a, a full chem panel and a CBC, and I have the results before I even see the patient. And so that's an efficiency model that by having six exam rooms, I can kind of float, you know, from one to the other. I like this equipment for a lot of reasons. You can have a fractious cat, and you only need like uh, two drops of blood. You don't have to have a big sample, and, and it's very, very fast. And... Um, so that point of care being able to test it's it's really good and um, you know that very accurate and cost effective and my technicians aren't tied up with having to centrifuge blood down oftentimes and do a lot of a lot of extra work so I can get those results pretty quick and then um, that data comes out of those uh, machines and goes right into this computer and then it goes to the mainframe and it's in you know I have nine different terminals in the practice and so anybody can pull up that patient's blood work results from any point and, and look at them and then communicate it right to the client and, uh, and, and have that information pretty close. But Joseph and Karen have been wonderful. They've toted me around in their cars and uh, got me to hotels and airports all week and uh, gosh, wonderful people. Um, and it's just been a joy to get to know them and, and get to know a lot of veterinarians too. So here's the historical hurdles and uh, you know, we've come a long way and I remember when they developed the first monthly heartworm prevention pill. Um, and they gave me the price of that. And I'm thinking, I knew what the filarabits were, the little daily ones. I'm thinking, there's no way anybody will pay that for once a month for a one pill for, to prevent heartworms. And then people would come in and buy a six-month supply like, no big deal. Or a year's supply, no big deal. And that, that was a big hurdle for me for, for, a, for a while. And then we were just uh, discussing before the meeting about pain management. When I graduated from school, they, you know, we, we were under the uh, impression that we needed dogs to lay around and hurt a little bit so they didn't tear their stitches out. You know what I mean? Now that's malpractice if we don't have preoperative and intraoperative and postoperative pain management. And so we've come a long way. But I had mental hurdles because when Remedel came out at the price point that it is, and then Deramax, which is uh, like Prevacox, it's Novartis's product, and then Prevacox, and you look at that, the cost of those pills, and I'm thinking, there's no way people will do that. You know, this old large animal guy is, uh, you know, taking a look at things from a purely a, 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 a cow perspective, so to speak. And then this idea of using IV catheters for every surgery, and you might not believe this, but other than cat neuters, every animal that goes under anesthesia gets an IV catheter in my hospital. Every one of them. And um, clients don't bat an eye. And, and, you know, they can refuse it on the anesthesia release form if they want to. But um, the, other than some rescue spays and neuters that we do, we do some rescue work, you know, to cut cost. And uh, we, we don't put catheters in them and, and so forth. But 